All right, so let's get going with the material for this lecture. So I'm going to introduce our first machine learning technique. In fact, I talked a little bit about it last class, so nearest neighbor. Um, it is a basic technique. There's actually not much to get excited yet about nearest neighbor, but don't worry. We're going to get into some more complex, more elegant techniques. Uh, and at some point, we're going to get into deep learning. So the first half of the course will cover the basics and also the foundation, including classic machine learning. And then the second half of the course, we're going to talk about uh, various models in, in deep learning as well. But yeah, we need to do this gradually. So if you're hoping that we're going to talk about deep learning, just hang on. This will happen, but later in the course. OK, so as a quick recap, um, last class, we introduced supervised learning. We discussed inductive learning. And then we formalized uh, this form of learning as follows. So we have some inputs, x. We also have the output that is produced by some function f that is unknown. And then that gives us now a data set. And then the question is, can we figure out uh, some underlying function f that uh, is used to produce the output based on the inputs? Now, the reality is that we never have that function f. We don't know what it is. We'll never know what it is. So what we do is we essentially search for a hypothesis h that approximates f. Right? So, so throughout the course, I'm going to use f to indicate the function that we're trying to discover. And here, it, it's really an imaginary function, right? So we don't have it. We never have it as a ground truth, right? But that's sort of like our gold standard. And what we're going to be able to do practically is to find some approximation. And we call that a hypothesis. And that's why I'm going to denote that by h. OK, so quick question. So here, I'm calling this inductive learning. And then there's also deductive learning. Does anybody know what is the difference between inductive and deductive learning? OK, so all of you are learners, right? So you're, you're taking courses, right? So what's the difference between inductive and deductive learning? OK, so we've actually all performed both of them. So OK, in, in deductive learning, you would be essentially given a rule, uh, some concept, and then provided with some examples. And then you would be asked to essentially apply this rule to some examples to deduce what you need to do uh, with respect to, to those examples. And inductive learning is the other way around, where you're provided with some examples. And then you need to figure out what is the underlying rule or what is the underlying function that explains these, these examples. And then so uh, in machine learning, we're focused mostly on inductive learning because we are starting from examples. And, and precisely the goal is to recover what is the underlying function, the underlying law that, that explains this. OK. Um, now, when we focus on supervised learning, there are traditionally two different classes of problems that are known as classification and regression. So I'm going to write on the board um, what is the main difference between the two. Uh, so this is an important difference because we'll see that some algorithms are suitable for classification but not regression, and, and vice versa. OK. All right, so classification. Um, so what characterizes classification is the range, or if you prefer, the output space. So the range of the function f is going to be categorical. OK, so here the key is categorical. And then for regression, So again, the range, or if you prefer, the output space of f is continuous. OK, so that's the main difference. So here, um, 
What's interesting to note as well is that this is only with respect to the outputs, not the inputs. Okay, so our function has both inputs and outputs. It turns out that uh, for the output, are discrete, then there's a set of techniques often based on uh, discrete optimization, logic, and, and, and so on that can be used. But if the outputs are continuous, then often we're going to use continuous optimization techniques or there's a, there's a different uh, type of math that we can use to address this. And that's in part why uh, historically uh, classification and regression are considered two different parts of, of supervised learning. And in fact, if you take some courses in statistics, so for instance here in, in, uh, at, at the University of Waterloo, so we have a, a, a statistics course that's precisely on classification, and then there's another one that's precisely on, on regression. Now in this course, we're going to talk about both. And uh, for machine learning, uh, the modern view is that today, especially when we talk about deep learning, a lot of the algorithms, in fact, can be used for both. But historically, uh, there was this important distinction. And then we're going to see that for some of the classic algorithms, this distinction is important because you can typically apply algorithms to one but not the other. Any questions regarding this? OK, very good. Let's continue. OK, so now I'm going to give you some examples for both classification and regression. Um, so as a simple example for classification, um, we could consider a setting where you'd like to practice some sport, and it's an outdoor sport. And then um, there is, I guess in your head, some implicit function whereby, depending on the weather on the day, you might feel like, yes, you will enjoy doing that sport because it's a good day, or no, you won't uh, enjoy it. Okay, And that might depend, for instance, on whether um, the sky is sunny or not. Uh, whether the humidity is normal or high, the wind is strong or not, the water is warm or cool, the forecast uh, for the next day is going to be the same or is going to change, and so on. So we could consider different attributes like this. And now uh, we can treat this as a classification problem where x is going to be the input. So that means it's uh, the set of attributes that we feed to our function, or to our classifier. And then the output here is uh, another attribute, so in this case it's just a binary value, yes or no, and, and then it's produced by this implicit function f. So again, the function f, we don't have it, right? This is something in your head, so you don't realize it, but implicitly, every day, either you feel good about you know, doing that sport depending on the weather or not. Okay, and now if we want to treat this as a machine learning problem, because presumably, let's say it's a sport you, you would like to do with a friend, and now you're thinking of inviting your friend, and you'd like to guess whether your friend's answer is going to be yes or no based on the weather, right? So now your friend also has such a function, and now you've recorded that, let's say on certain days, your friend said yes or said no, uh, depending on, on, on the weather. So we could formulate some hypotheses, um, so here these hypotheses are essentially guesses of what is the underlying function that your friend has for um, deciding whether or not he or she is going to like doing that sport. So uh, here um, the first one says that if the sky is sunny, then your friend enjoys a sport. The second one says if the water is cool or um, the forecast is going to be the same, then again your friend enjoys the sport. So these are simple rules. In this case, there are logical rules, but it just illustrates that these are possible rules that one could come up with in terms of guessing what might be that function. OK, any questions regarding this example? OK, very good. Let's continue. So now, um, as a classic example for regression, so here the output is going to be continuous value, so that's the main distinction. So we can illustrate this often by saying that we have some data in some space, and then the y-axis corresponds to the output. The x-axis would be the inputs. It might be a, a high-dimensional input, but then just for the purpose of this example, it's just one dimension. And then every data point, corresponds to those x's. And then the process of, of finding 
uh, some function here uh, would correspond to, to um, a form of a supervised machine learning. And then we might find either a linear function or, or a quadratic function. So these are all hypotheses for what is the underlying function. OK. Now, these were uh, abstract examples. But let's have a look at some concrete real world examples and discuss whether or not uh, they correspond to classification problems or regression problems. So I'm going to write those on the board as well. OK, so the first one is spam detection. <coughs> Can anybody suggest what might be the input to a spam detector that we could use, let's say, in, in a machine learning setting? Yeah. Right, so it's going to be text. Obviously, today, emails can also have images, videos, and other things. But the most basic thing would just be text. And how would we represent the text concretely? Any ideas? Yeah. Right, so we're going to have to boil this down to some kind of string. Right, and then presumably a vector. Now there's lots of representations. So in natural language processing, you can use a one hot vector for every single word and then create a long string out of those. Or you could have a vector embedding for every single word as well. These would be two of the popular techniques. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a vector. OK, so um, yeah, in terms of the input or the domain, so we're going to have text. Uh, that correspond to, let's say, vectors of words. OK, and now what about the range or the output? So if we're doing spam detection, what might be the output space? Yeah. Uh, spam or not spam? Right, so spam or not spam. So here we're going to have a simple set, so spam. And let me call the other option legit. OK, so then based on this, um, so it should be obvious that now this is a, a classification problem, right? Because I only have two possible outputs. They're categorical. All right, the next example is stock prediction. Uh, so what might be some of the inputs that we could feed in to an algorithm that would do stock price prediction? Yeah. A time series of prices? Right, so a time series of prices. OK, and what about the output space? What would that be? Yeah. <laughs> OK, so yeah, so I guess here it could be something binary. The next day, is it going to increase or decrease? Um, so that's one way to do it. Now, if we really wanted to predict the price itself, what would be the space? So I say that again? All the, all the real numbers, presumably the, the positive real numbers, right? <laughs> OK, so yeah, so here for the range, yeah, we could have two possibilities. So I'll put here up and down. So this could be one prediction. Or it could be uh, the positive reals. Now, if it is up or down, this will be a classification problem. If it is the positive reals, then this would become a regression problem. But now here, I, I guess I should be careful. So when I say that it would be a regression problem, right? so stock prices, in fact, we cannot have arbitrary numbers, arbitrary reals. right? So prices are typically rounded uh, to some unit, often cents. right? So in that sense, uh, it's not all the reals. But uh, practically, we can often still treat this as if it was a regression problem, where uh, there's enough of those uh, uh, values possible, uh, and then they are ordered in a way that uh, we can often just think of this as still a regression problem. OK, so the next one is speech recognition. Uh, 
Okay, can anybody suggest what would be the input for speech recognition? Voice. voice. Okay, and how is voice fed to a computer typically? Okay, so I hear people murmuring, so anybody suggest something? Yes. Right, so we have a time series, and typically it's an audio signal, right? Um, or the, uh, it's essentially some measure of the air pressure, right? Okay, and what would be the output space for speech recognition? What does, what does the recognizer produce? Uh, okay, so I heard the person, so I guess, yeah, for speech recognition, in some cases it might be a question of recognizing who's the speaker, but I'm actually more interested in recognizing what is being spoken, so what's the output? Yeah? Uh, the encoding of the words, like the spam uh, recognition, the input of the spam recognition would be the output of the... <laughs> Right, okay, so I, I guess yeah, it's going to be words, uh, generally speaking. And uh, okay, so here there's in fact many possibilities. So depending on what speech recognizer you're using, uh, it, it might produce words, it might also just produce phonemes, or it might produce like, I guess, a, a, a full sentence, right? So there's different levels of, of recognition. Perhaps what's most common is to consider words. Uh, so if we consider words, Um, so now, is that a classification problem or a regression problem? So who would vote for classification here? Okay, and who would vote for regression? Oh, okay, so the class is unanimous. Everybody voted for classification. What's the reason for this here? Yeah. There's a finite set of words that you arrange into a sequence as the open. Okay, so yeah, there's a fine set of words, and at least traditionally, if we think of the set of words as being the words in the dictionary, the dictionary is finite, so yes, there's a finite number of them, and that's categorical because we cannot order them per se, there isn't an order. Now, that being said, today, um, we could say that the number of words is not fixed, right? So, with text messages and, and social media platforms, people are inventing new words all the time, so, so the set of words is growing. Uh, I mean, it might not be infinite because if you consider still um, the fact that, uh, okay, all the words are essentially sequences of characters, if you uh, bound the length of, of a word, then there's still going to be a finite number of such sequences, so it's still going to be finite. So, so in any case, I guess, yeah, we would typically treat this as a classification problem because um, uh, these things are discrete, we cannot order them, and, and then usually we assume that, that it's finite too. But then, if any of you have experience with natural language processing, right, words are often encoded using some embedding, right? So there's going to be often a vector, and then it's a vector of real numbers that can be used to encode words. So would that make this a regression problem or not? Okay, so I, I guess I, I hear, um, yeah, it might be tempting to still see this as a regression problem, but um, what happens is that this, would, this embedding is not typically the final output, right? So, so you still want to convert this type of word embedding into an actual word, a sequence of characters. So from that perspective, the final task is, is really classification. So even though there might be some intermediate representation in terms of continuous values, the final output is, is typically discrete, so it's a classification problem. Okay, uh, all right, the next one is digit recognition. Okay, so what's uh, a possible domain or possible input for digit recognition? 
Okay, so we saw examples of this last class. What was the input? Does anybody remember? Yes. Yes, a bitmap, or more generally speaking, images, right? Okay, and what about the output? So, okay, the output here should be pretty clear. Uh, so it's going to be digits themselves, um, so zero up to nine. And here, we would treat this as a classification problem um, because even though um, these digits are ordered, in terms of the classification, right, there's no reason why we should think of, let's say, the number five as being greater than the number three from a recognition uh, perspective, right? It's, it's a question of pattern recognition. There's a pattern for each digit, but then those patterns do not have any ordering. The labeling often that we use, which is the digit itself, has an ordering, but that doesn't matter here, okay? So that's why we would treat this as a classification problem. Okay, the next one, housing valuation. Okay, so let's say that uh, you're buying a house and you'd like to, I guess, get an estimate for the price. Uh, or let's say it's a mortgage company that is trying to also estimate the value of a house. Um, what might be the input for a system that could uh, predict the value of a house? Yeah. Uh, number of bedrooms and bathrooms and the size and whether it has garage. Very good, yeah. So all kinds of features like number of bedrooms, whether there's a garage, whether there's a basement, and, 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 and so on, right? So typically, if you get a mortgage or you're buying a house, right, especially for, buying a, a, for, for getting a mortgage, you're gonna answer a questionnaire where they're gonna ask you all kinds of features about the house and that's being fed essentially to a system that will then estimate roughly what might be the value. Okay, so here I'll simply write house features so some of those features might be discrete, categorical, or continuous. It doesn't matter. This is the domain. What about the range? What's the output space here for house valuation? Yeah? Right, positive real numbers because it's just a, a dollar value. And therefore, this is going to be a, a regression problem. Okay, the last one, weather prediction. Okay, so what might be inputs that are fed to um, a weather prediction program? Yeah, so sensor data, presumably that would measure, let's say, temperature, wind, humidity, and so on, at the same location, nearby locations, and, and, and so on. And yeah. Satellite ah, and satellite imagery as well. Yeah, so I guess here, yeah, we can use a, a rich set of, of sensor data. Um, okay, so sensor, oops, yeah, sensor data. Uh, including <coughs> satellite imagery. Okay, and what about the output? What is being predicted when you take an app, let's say, that does weather prediction? Okay, so I'm sure all of you have looked at weather prediction apps. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, chance of rain or millimeters of rain or snow or whatever other phenomenon. Okay, so I guess, uh, okay, maybe the simplest could just be to start with is it going to rain or not, right? And, and then what's the other big one that's typically predicted? 
temperature, right? So, so here, these would be the two common ones. So rain versus sun, and also uh, the temperature, which would be a real number. Okay, and then so for rain versus sun, this would be a classification problem, and then for the temperature, this would be a regression problem. Okay, any questions regarding these examples? Yes? Right, okay, so yeah, the question is about how large is the output space? Does this matter in terms of deciding whether it's classification or regression? Because we've seen, uh, like for stock price prediction uh, and, and also for um, the case of um, uh, speech recognition, where the output space can be discrete, can be very large. In the case of stock price prediction, we said, well, uh, let's just think of it as, as a regression problem and then somehow in the case of speech recognition we said oh no that's a classification problem but here the distinction between the two is that for prices even though they're discrete they're rounded let's say to the second decimal right they are ordered right so there's a continuum of those and then the magnitude the relative magnitude matters whereas in the case of of words right there's no notion of one word being higher or lower than another one so from that perspective it's more categorical, right? So that's that's really where the distinction lies. Okay. All right, so let's continue. Okay, so in terms of uh, doing machine learning, as I explained, we're going to find a hypothesis, but typically we need to find that hypothesis by doing a search in some space. And we're going to call the search space the hypothesis space. Um, and with this hypothesis space, uh, we can formulate the search very often as some sort of optimization problem. So here I've got an objective where it says find the hypothesis H that maximizes, uh, sorry, that minimizes either misclassification or some um, uh, error function and then all of this with respect to some training examples. So this is written in words, but you can think of it as an optimization problem. So very often machine learning technique will correspond to some form of optimization, right? We're gonna have an objective. Typically we're gonna minimize some objective and that objective might be misclassification error or more generally some error function. And then the, uh, the, this misclassification or the error function will depend on some training sets so or some, some examples. Okay, so if that's how we're going to do things, then you might say, well, why do we have to have a field known as machine learning? I mean, if this is optimization, then we, just, we should just stop here and then just turn this course into an optimization course, right? Well, it turns out that um, uh, this is not exactly what we want per se. At the end of the day, uh, minimizing misclassification or, or some error function is a good thing, but what we really want is to see how the resulting hypothesis will generalize to unseen examples. Okay, and, and this is interesting. This is what makes machine learning interesting in its own right and in fact different from pure optimization. Um, now the way it's phrased here, um, pure optimizers might look at this and say, well, you're crazy. I mean, this is an ill-defined problem. How can you uh, formulate something like this and say that the real criteria now is going to be to measure how well we're doing with respect to unseen examples that we don't have, right? But, but that's the whole point of, of machine learning. So here, this isn't black magic, right? We're gonna see that we can actually formalize that. 
and then the key will be to bring together optimization with statistics. Okay, so here one way to think about this is that we, when we minimize this objective, it will be with respect to a sample of data that we call the training example. So it's going to be a sample from some underlying distribution. And then the unseen examples, we can think of them as more samples that are coming from that same distribution. And here we haven't seen them yet, but the assumption is that they come from the same distribution. So from that perspective, we can make the problem um, well-defined. Okay, so it's not black magic and it's not pure optimization because at the end of the day, that's what we'll care about, this notion of generalization and we can operationalize this by uh, thinking of it this way, that, that really our, our data correspond to samples from some distribution and then the future accuracy means the accuracy on more samples from that same distribution. Okay, and, and that also explains why in this course we're going to see a lot of concepts that will be borrowed from optimization and also from statistics because the two together will allow us to work with this type of formalization. Any questions regarding this? Okay, very good. All right, so as I explained, the goal will be to make sure that we find a hypothesis that generalizes well. Now, often, one way to, to think about this, at least at the very intuitive level, is that any hypothesis H that is found to approximate the target function F well over a sufficiently large set of training examples will also approximate the target function well over any observed examples. So what this is really saying, perhaps more formally, is that if we have um, a hypothesis that is approximating the underlying function f well on some large sample, okay, and then if the sample is really large, if it's, you know, infinitely large, then it does represent well the underlying distribution. And then it's normal that on future examples, it's also going to do well because if I've seen enough samples from a distribution, those samples are by themselves a good representation of that distribution, and therefore I'm, I'm going to get good accuracy on future examples as well. Okay, so, so that's the paradigm that we're going to work with. Now, um, it is also very interesting to see sometimes when we find a hypothesis, how consistent is it with the data that we have in, in our training set. So, so in general, if the hypothesis agrees with um, F on all the examples in our training set, then we're going to see that it's, it's a consistent hypothesis. And then this would be something desirable, right? So we would like to find perhaps some hypothesis that, that is consistent uh, most of the time. But it turns out that this is not always possible and in fact not always desirable either. So it won't be possible in situations where our hypothesis space is going to be insufficient. So as a concrete example, what if I have some underlying function f that is ax plus b plus x sine x. Okay, so that's a function that I just picked, right? And let's say this is the, the function that, that I'm trying to discover, x, um, ax plus b plus x sine x. And now I'm searching for um, this function in the space of polynomials of finite degrees. Well, it turns out that this function is not part of the space of polynomials of finite degrees, so I won't be able to find it. So at some level, this is already impossible. We cannot find um, uh, a hypothesis that is consistent. Now, does anybody know why this function is not part of the polynomials of finite degrees? Yes? Because the uh, sign uh, is the combination of infinite uh, a polynomial, so when we expand sign in terms of like killer series, then, uh, uh, then it will be like infinitely uh, a power. 
And Very good. Yeah, so, so the sine function, if we represent it with a Taylor series expansion, will require an infinite number of terms. And each one of those terms is going to be a polynomial, but then the degrees of those polynomials are going to grow as well. And so, it's, so we're going to requ require uh, infinitely large degrees as well for the polynomial. So here, if we bound the polynomials to have finite degrees, we cannot represent the sine function. Okay, so yeah, so that's an example. Now you might say, well, okay, that's that seems like a very contrived mathematical example. But what what about in practice? Okay, so in practice, let's say that we're doing object recognition based on images, right? The functions for that. Uh, the function that I guess our brain uses to recognize what is in an image is actually very complex. And, and this is very interesting because we, we actually have the function, it's in our brain already because we, we are using it every day. When we just look out at the world, we can recognize everything that we see quite well. So we are effectively uh, you know, demonstrating that a function exists, but then it's presumably a complex one and to this day, um, it's, it's not clear that there is uh, a space of function that would necessarily uh, capture that very well, right? So, so very often um, in computer vision, we're going to search in some space, maybe the space of neural networks, right? And then uh, we might not be able to capture some uh, complex functions if our space of neural nets is, is bounded as well. Okay, so in practice, most of the time for very complex problems, uh, our hypothesis space is going to be insufficient. Okay, the other problem that can arise is noisy data. So, uh, for instance, in weather prediction, it does happen quite often that you look up a prediction and then what happens in reality is actually quite different. And here it's not that the weatherman just lied to us, okay, it's that doing this type of prediction is difficult. So, so it relies on sensor data. The sensors are themselves noisy, so they don't measure things um, accurately. And even on two days that have the exact same measurement, it's possible that the next day for which we're doing a prediction, something different will happen. Right? So if you have the same input, but you have a different output, then there's something noisy about this. Maybe you don't have enough inputs or the inputs themselves are not accurate and so on. And, and then so uh, we won't be able to find a function that can explain that data because we've got two data points that have different outputs even though they have the same input. Okay, so yeah, so this uh, should uh, convince you that we will not be able to find in general consistent hypotheses. Um, and then if we cannot do that, um, often we're going to say that the problem is unrealizable. So, so I guess, yeah, if, if, if uh, the true underlying hypothesis is part of our hypothesis space, then it's realizable, and if not, it's unrealizable. And, and the word unrealizable might feel like it means like impossible and therefore it's bad, but it's not so bad, okay? So in practice, um, then it might be tempting to say, well, let's just try to have a hypothesis space that is as large as possible so that we could capture as many functions as possible and then there's a higher chance we're going to have um, a problem that is realizable. But then um, this may not necessarily be a good thing. It's not necessarily a good thing because if you consider, let's say, the largest possible hypothesis space that a computer could work with, which would be at least today with classical computers, let's say the space of Turing machines, right? Then this will be a very large space to search, right? So here we're going to have a trade-off between expressiveness and complexity. Okay, so if you have a large hypothesis space, it's more expressive, it, there's a higher chance you can find a, a good hypothesis in that space, but then you still have to do the search. Right? So doing that search is going to be complex, both in terms of time, in terms of space, but also in terms of data. So an important problem in, in machine learning is data complexity. So if you have a large hypothesis space, you're going to need more data to find the, what function in there is, is the best one, because you need to compare lots of hypotheses, and you're going to need more data.
So what this means is that um, it's not necessarily a good thing to aim for the largest hypothesis space possible. Pract in practice, often we, we have to deal with this trade-off. And, and then so you want to find a space that contains reasonable function and can be searched um, in a tractable way. OK, any questions regarding this? All right, let's continue. OK, so we're now ready to talk about our first machine learning technique, um, nearest neighbor. Uh, very simple technique, again, perhaps nothing super exciting yet, but it will be helpful to illustrate some important concepts that arise in the context of machine learning. So here I'm going to define um, the nearest neighbor classifier with um, the following function. So it returns a hypothesis. So this hypothesis takes as input a data point, a query x, and then it returns a label y, and this will be the label of the closest point x star. So here x star is the point that has the smallest distance uh, according to some distance measure. And here I can consider lots of distance measures, but as concrete examples, I could have an L1 distance measure, L2 that corresponds to the Euclidean distance, or more generally uh, what is known as the LP distance, uh, so where you have uh, an exponent p here and the p truth. And then we can um, extend this further by also giving some weights to, to the dimension so that we have essentially a weighted distance measure. So these are examples. Uh, there's lots of distance measures that one can consider. But then the idea of, of this technique is that we have a database right, of examples. Now we have a query, a new data point, and we want to classify it. So what we can do is simply search for the closest point in our database look up what is its label, and return that label. Okay, so this is what is expressed here mathematically. right? So the nearest neighbor classifier returns the label of the closest point in our database according to some distance measure. Okay, so an interesting question then is how can we understand or visualize what really happens in terms of the classification? So here, classification problems, what they really um, end up boiling to is some sort of partitioning of the space. So here, imagine that I have data points. Every dot here is a data point that's part of my training set. Right? And now if I'm running the nearest neighbor classifier, what happens that implicitly, uh, we can imagine that there are some regions around every data point where any point that I query that's in that region will essentially be mapped to the closest point, that is the point in that region, and then we will return the label of that point. So what this shows is essentially the space or the region around each point in my training set such that any query in that region will return that point because it's the closest one. And then this allows us to understand better what is happening with nearest neighbor because effectively it is partitioning the input space into different regions and then a label for those regions are given by the point in, in the region. Okay, and this particular partitioning is known as a Voronoi diagram um, when it is obtained by essentially doing nearest neighbor uh, by using the Euclidean distance. If you're using the Euclidean distance, uh, the regions will naturally appear by essentially having boundaries that are straight lines. Okay, and that's a property of the Euclidean distance because essentially, you see the boundary is going to be exactly halfway in between two points and that essentially produces some straight lines. And then, I mean, every region is going to have um, uh, several straight lines because then there are boundaries with many other points nearby, but that's the idea. Okay, any questions regarding this slide? Okay, good. Um, now, working with the nearest neighbor is, um, as I said, a, a simple thing that we can do. It, it actually does work well in many situations, but it tends to be unstable. So here, you see the idea is that we're going to return the class, 
of the point that is the closest, but what if we have some noise in our data because the data comes from sensor that produce measurements, but those measurements are inaccurate, right? So then what we think is the closest point might not really be, and then even if we have the closest point, maybe the label has some mistake as well. So, so you know, it's, 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 um, it's a very brittle approach. It's not stable because if there's noise, then it, it will affect our classification. So an interesting question then is, how can we make nearest neighbor more robust to noise? And one idea is to consider the k nearest neighbors. Okay, so instead of producing a label just based on the nearest neighbor, let's consider a set of neighbors, and then we're going to look at what is the most frequent class for that set of neighbors, and then return that. So the idea is that if one of those points you know, was misclassified, or one of those points we didn't have uh, good accuracy, then hopefully the set overall will still be fine, and then we should get some uh, answer that is more stable. Okay, so k nearest neighbor can be written in this form mathematically. So it's going to find the mode. So here the mode that means the most frequent class in that set. And here we're looking at the class of every point x prime that is part of the set of, of k nearest neighbors. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a simple generalization of nearest neighbor. And, and then, yeah, you've got the mathematical form here. Otherwise, you've got uh, the, the word description. OK, so, so now if we're going to consider k nearest neighbor, an interesting question that might come to your mind is, well, what should k be, right? So nearest neighbor is essentially one nearest neighbor, but should I consider two, three, four, five? What's the right number of neighbors that I should consider? OK, it turns out that this is not an easy question to answer. Um, but we can do some experiments and observe what happens empirically. So in, um, in this figure, I've got um, the partitioning that is implied by nearest neighbor with k equals 1. Here it's k equals 3. And then we also have k equals 31. Okay, so um, I can consider 1, 3, 31 neighbors. I could consider any other number of neighbors as well. Now, if you look at the partitioning, so this partitioning, right, is, is similar to the Voronoi diagram that we just saw before. The main difference is that I'm not showing every single region. I'm just showing um, what is the color of the regions um, that correspond to, to certain classes. So here we have three classes, blue, green, and red. And then I'm simply merging together all the regions that belong to the same class. So all the greens are together in one region, all the reds are together, and all the blue are together. Okay? But it's really, there's really a Voronoi diagram underlying this. Okay, so now um, when we look at this, it, it, it's still quite intuitive that um, whenever I see like a red point here, then naturally I'm going to have a red region around it because the, the nearest, I mean, this is going to be the nearest neighbor for some points in, in, in that region and so on. But then when I look at k equals 3, it becomes to be a little less intuitive. Like you see this red point here somehow is in the green region. Right? And that's possible because I'm considering the three nearest neighbors. And then if I have a query for the point that's exactly where the red dot is here, right, then the three nearest neighbors include the red dot, but also two green dots. And because the two green dots are the majority, so the green class is the most frequent, right, then that's why all of this here is green. OK, and, and now if we go to 31 neighbors, uh, it becomes even less intuitive, so we've got regions, um, and then you can see that there's some red here, some green here, and then, I mean, the boundaries are, are quite complex, but there is an implicit partitioning that arises in this way. And here, just to be clear, the partitioning that arises is not something that we compute, right? So when we do k nearest neighbor, we do not compute those pictures. This is just for illustration to understand, you know, what is really happening with this type of, of classifier. 
Okay, so um, based on those pictures, uh, who would feel that having three neighbors uh, is best? And who would feel that having 31 neighbors is best? So raise your hand if you think that k equals 3 would be best. All right, so we've got quite a few people. What about k equals 31? Okay, we've got one person there, another one at the back. So, okay, there's a few people. So here it turns out that, yeah, it's, it's a difficult question because um, we, we can probably look at specific parts of the pictures and argue for or against. Uh, generally speaking, it will be problem dependent, and, and then we're going to need um, some way of, of um, uh, deciding, but then if there's not enough neighbors, three might still not be enough to have something stable, but then 31 might be too many neighbors. In fact, if uh, you grow the number of neighbors to correspond to the size of the data set, then you would effectively classify everything in the same way because all the points would be part of the neighbors, and then you would essentially just assign everything to be the most frequent class in your data set. Right? So you cannot increase the number of neighbors too much. So here there seems to be a trade-off. Right? So we know that too few neighbors is not going to perform well, and too many neighbors is not going to perform well. So it's probably somewhere in between, and it's never really clear um, how, how to choose k. OK, so um, now if we want to evaluate an algorithm in machine learning, um, a standard way, in fact, the, the correct way of doing this is that we take our data, and then we're going to split our data into two parts. There's going to be a training set and a test set. And then we're going to train only in a training set, and then test on separate data that we call the test set. OK, and this is something very important. Uh, for Machine Learning 101, the number one rule is that you never train and test on the same data. Okay, so we're going to see in a moment why. But uh, here's a, a procedure that would be OK to follow, right? where we uh, would essentially uh, collect a large sample of, of examples, then divide this into two disjoint sets, so a training set and a test set. We would learn a hypothesis H on the training set, and then measure its accuracy on the test set. And here what's really important is this word disjoint. right? So the training set and the test set need to be different. Okay? You should never train and test on the same data. OK, so to illustrate what happens, I'm going to draw some curve here to indicate what um, is uh, more or less the expected accuracy that one could expect as we vary the number of uh, neighbors k, and also as we test on the training set and then test on the test set. OK, so the x-axis is k, the number of neighbors. The y-axis is going to be the percentage of correct outputs. Right? So in classification, we produce some outputs. They're discrete. They're categorical. We can compare them to what is the correct output in, in our training set, and then simply count what's the fraction of those that is correct. And that's going to be our percentage here of correct. So that's our accuracy measure. Now, if we're um, essentially evaluating one nearest neighbor, so I'm going to start with k equals to 1. And now if we simply evaluate with respect to the training set. So, so we've got our training set, and, and we're measuring the accuracy after training on the training set again. I'm going to claim here that what happens is that we're going to have an accuracy that's essentially 100%. Okay, so it's going to be 100% because um, every query right, is a point in a training set that's part of our database. And then so when we find the nearest neighbor, we're going to find exactly that point again into our database. Then we're going to look up the label of that point, which is the correct label, and return it. Therefore, we're going to get the correct label all the time, and we're going to get 100% accuracy. Okay, so this looks great. But 
typically what will happen then is um, uh, there will be a gap with respect to, to the test set. Uh, but in any case, okay, if we continue with training, so it starts at 100%, and then as we increase k, the accuracy will typically go down. So this will be for the training set. And now if we also measure the accuracy with respect to the test set, so we're going to have a different phenomenon where the accuracy will look like this. Okay, so here, so that's the test set. Okay, so we know that if we start with one nearest neighbor, as I explained before, there's going to be some noise, and very often the, the predictions are, are not going to be accurate because they're, they're going to be perturbed by, by the noise. Okay, so, so often we want to increase k, we want to consider more than one nearest neighbor to reduce the effect of noise. There's going to be um, an optimal k that gives us the best accuracy on, on, on the test set. Right, so this will be our, our best k. Um, and then if we go further, at some point, we're going to have too many neighbors, and then we're going to include neighbors that are so far that they're just going to, um, uh, I guess, impact in a negative way the classification. So they're going to corrupt the classification, and things are going to get worse again. So that's typically what happens for, for the test set. OK, any questions regarding those curves? Yeah? Oh, oh, OK, so here, this is not 0 per se, OK? Yes, I drew the x and y axis, but I, I, I guess, yeah, this is not 0 per se. So, so obviously, the accuracy is going to be much better than, than 0. So it depends on, on the problem, right? It depends on the number of classes. But typically, you're going to start with an accuracy above 0, and, and, and then it will also end above 0. OK, so I guess um, I need to, <laughs> OK, I, I should redo this curve then. Let me redo it. Um, so yeah, let's just go like this, like this. How's that? Oh, no, no, no. Why is why, why it increases and Oh, why does it increase and decrease? Yeah, so here, as I was explaining, Right, so the accuracy on a test set, if you have only one nearest neighbor, right, then it's going to pick up a lot of noise and your accuracy is going to be bad. So it's not going to generalize well to future data. If you increase k, you get, to have, you, you get something that tends to be more stable, so the accuracy typically improves. But then if you have too many neighbors at some point, um, then some of those neighbors are really far. They, they actually have no predictive power, but we're using them to, to make the prediction. And then they're corrupting our prediction. So at some point, uh, it tends to get worse again. So that's the idea. OK, so when we do machine learning, there will often be two common regimes. So either we're going to do, we're going to do our search, and, and then we're going to be in some type of underfitting regime, or we might be into an overfitting regime. So here, underfitting means that um, we have an algorithm that finds a hypothesis H with um, some training accuracy that is lower than the future accuracy of some other hypothesis H prime. So the idea is that if we're underfitting, we're not finding the best possible hypothesis. There might be another hypothesis H prime that would perform better, and we're just not finding it. Um, a common cause for this is um, the fact that perhaps our classifier is not expressive enough, which really means that our hypothesis space is not expressive enough. So like for instance, if we're doing regression, and then you restrict yourself to the space of linear function, but really um, you, you, you're trying to fit something that is not linear, then you will be underfitting. You will not be able to find uh, necessarily the, 
a, a, a good uh, solution here. Um, okay, so I also have here um, a mathematical estimate for underfitting, for the amount of underfitting. Uh, so typically, underfitting is not formally defined, but here I decided to include a formal mathematical definition for it. Uh, we're going to see in a moment how that relates to, to the graph that I have on, on the board. Uh, so yeah, let's go to the next slide, but we're going to come back to this in, in, in a moment. Okay, the other regime, as I mentioned, would be overfitting. Here, the issue is that we're fitting the data so well that we're in fact fitting some of the noise in the data, and that affects our accuracy as well. And typically, we can tell that we have some overfitting whenever an algorithm finds a hypothesis H with higher training accuracy than its future accuracy. And here when I say future accuracy, I mean essentially the true underlying accuracy that one could experience uh, with some future data. And we cannot typically measure what is the future accuracy at the time of training. But then, uh, as I explained before, whenever we've got a data set and we split it into training and testing, then we can reserve the test set for essentially evaluating what might be the future accuracy. Okay, so, so here I also have a mathematical definition for overfitting to be the maximum of zero or the difference between the training accuracy and then the future accuracy, which I will approximate by the test accuracy. So again, the idea is that future accuracy would be accuracy, uh, the true underlying accuracy that I would experience in the future. I don't know what that is, but if I have some data and I've actually partitioned it and I haven't touched or I haven't looked at the test set, then I can use the test set to simulate future data. Right? And then, so this will give me a sense of how good is my future accuracy. So that's why here it's, it's really an approximation, but then I can approximate future accuracy with test accuracy. And then the common causes for that are that um, the classifier might be too expressive, we might have noisy data, or we might simply not have enough data. Okay, so let's go back to our drawing. And then um, here, let me highlight that in this picture, typically, if we are on this side, um, we're, we're going to be into an overfitting regime. And then if we are on this side, it's typically an underfitting regime. So again, ideally, I want to find the best k, right, that will give me the best accuracy on, on the test set. Now, I don't know really what is the best accuracy, but chances are when I'm going to pick my k, I will be on one side or, or the other side. If I'm on this side, I'm going to be overfitting because here there's going to be a gap between the accuracy that I get on my training set and the accuracy that I get on my test set. So here you see that's the reason why testing on the training set can be very misleading, right? So here it looks like we can get very high accuracy on the training set, but then in the future our accuracy is going to suffer and we can tell this simply by using as a proxy the error we get on the test set. So here um, the mathematical definition that I have for the amount of overfitting would correspond graphically to this. So let's say that um, I'm considering a certain k right here, um, and then I have some accuracy for training and testing, so I can measure the difference, and then this is essentially the amount of overfitting. Now if I just go back to the previous slide, for underfitting, I also have a mathematical definition. So here I define it to be the max of zero and uh, the, the difference between the best future accuracy I could get with any hypothesis minus the training accuracy. So this would correspond to the following. 
let's say that I've got another hypothesis here, K. Um, when I measure the training accuracy, it's here. Actually, let me, no, let me redo this. So let me choose the K here. Okay, so, and then the best that I could get would be up here. So this difference would be the amount of underfitting. Okay, and again here, these are regimes in general, so if you're on this side, you tend to suffer mostly from overfitting. If you're on this side, you tend to suffer mostly from underfitting, but you can actually have both, right? So if you look carefully at how I drew the curves, there's always a gap between the training curve and the test curve, right? So this gap does correspond to overfitting. So overfitting also happens on this side. Right? But it tends to be less important. The bigger issue on the right side is, is underfitting, that I'm essentially finding uh, something that is not as good as I could have otherwise. Okay. <clears throat> okay, any questions regarding this? Good, so let's continue. All right, so now that we've looked at this, um, an important question is how are we going to choose K? Right, because I showed you that K matters, right? So we might have better or worse accuracy, and there's a trade off, so choosing K is not obvious. So something intuitive would be simply to say, well, let me. Um, simply, well ideally I would select the K that has the highest future accuracy and then we discuss that future accuracy I can approximate this with my test accuracy so perhaps I can simply select the K that has the highest test accuracy. So I've got my graph here, right? I, I, I could plot this um, and then I could simply choose the K that has the best value for the, the test curve. But there's a problem. Right? If you do this, you're now violating rule number one of machine learning because if you're choosing K based on what, are, what is the accuracy in a test set, you're effectively treating the test set as the training set. Right? So K is a parameter, in fact it's what we call a hyperparameter that we're optimizing here and now we, we are optimizing it with respect to the test set. So that means a test set is really part of the training set. So I cannot trust that the accuracy reported is correct anymore. Because if I choose the best K this way, maybe I just got lucky with a certain K due to the fact that my test set is, is finite, small, a little bit noisy, and so on. And I think that this is the best K, but really it isn't. And then the true accuracy could be quite different. So this is a, a problem, okay? So, so here, we need to be careful, right? So we do not want to s optimize any hyperparameter like K with respect to the test set because then we're effectively treating the test set as the training set. And then when we do that, we cannot trust anymore the accuracy provided by the test set because it's not representative necessarily. Okay, so one solution for this is going to be to split our data into three sets instead of two sets. So we're going to have a training set, a validation set, and a test set. So here, the training set as before is going to be used to compute the nearest neighbor. The validation set now is going to compute or is going to allow us to optimize the hyperparameters such as K, and then a test set will serve as measuring performance. But here the key is that, again, we need to reserve some data that is never used for the training or even optimizing any hyperparameter. So, so the test set has to be separate from all this. And now if we need something to optimize some hyperparameters, well, let's create a validation set, and then we can use it for that purpose. Okay, so concretely, we could work with the following pseudocode. 
where we, um, we're going to let k be the number of neighbors, then we're going to have a loop where we go through all the possible values of k. We're going to train on the training data to find out some hypothesis. Then we're going to measure the accuracy um, with respect to the validation data only, right? because we don't want to touch the test data yet, so just the validation data. This will give us a sense of the accuracy for each k, and then we can pick the best k. So here, this returns the k that has uh, the highest accuracy. And once we've got this best k, so I'm going to call it k star, then I can evaluate what is the accuracy by training again. This time I'm going to train with respect to both the union of the training set and the validation set. So here this is okay because when it comes to training, right, so I've already now identified what should be my best k, so that's k star, and now I need to come up with again um, a, a, a hypothesis, right, so, so then I can use both the training set and the validation set for this, I'm going to get my hypothesis h, and then after that I check its, um, its accuracy with respect to the test data. Okay, so here there's a typo, this should just be h, there shouldn't be a, a, a subscript k, so this should just be h. Um, but okay, the, the key again is that you see the test set is only used at the very end to measure accuracy of our final hypothesis, but it's not used to choose k, right? So only the validation set is used for that, and then the validation set is kind of really part of the training set because we're using it to optimize hyperparameters like k. Any questions regarding this? Okay, very good. Um, okay, so this is good, but um, there's still a problem, right? Because here, if I'm going to select k based on how well our hypothesis performs with respect to a validation set, well, if my validation set is small and, and there's some noise and so on, I might be led in thinking that a certain k is the best one, but it might just be pure luck, right? because if I test with respect to many k's, one of them is going to be lucky, right? And, and, and it's, just, it's just going to be due to some noise and so on, and I'm going to think that this is the best one, but really it might not be the best one. So I'd like to make this choice more robust. An interesting question is what can I do about this, right? So, the obvious solution would be here to simply say that um, we, we could increase um, the size of the validation set, because if, if the problem is that my validation set is too small and I can't, it's not necessarily representative or I can't trust that, then let's increase it. So it's like saying that I have a larger sample from the underlying distribution, and at some point if it's large enough, it's representative and I can trust that. So this will solve the problem, but now it's going to create a new problem, right? Because then I'm going to effectively reduce the amount of data that is left for training. So I've got a trade-off, right? I want both the training set and the validation set to be as large as possible, and, and, and I can't, right? So, so I increase one and decrease the other one. So it turns out that we can actually circumvent that there is a way to use both the training set and the validation set for both training and validation, and then uh, that's known as cross-validation. Okay, so cross-validation works as follows. So we're going to take our data, uh, specifically the data that we're going to use for training, and we're going to split it into two parts, training and validation, but we're going to do this repeatedly. Instead of just doing it once, and hoping that what we get with the validation set is representative even though it's small, then perhaps we do this multiple times, we're going to split differently each time, and then take the average accuracy of, of all the experiments with respect to all of those splits. So when I do that, because I repeatedly do this, and I take the average, I tend to get something that, that is more robust. Okay, now if we're going to do this k times, there's a way to do this kind of systematically, uh, known as k-fold cross-validation. The idea is that we split the training data into k equal size subsets, and then we're going to run k experiments, and then each time we're going to validate on one subset and train on the rest uh, or on the remaining subsets. And, and then we compute the average of, of all that. 
OK, so um, this is written in words. Might not be obvious what exactly this means, but let's draw a picture that will make this clear. OK, so let's say that I've got some data. Uh, I can use this data for both training and validation. And, and so here's my data. What I'm going to do here is illustrate fourfold validation, fourfold cross validation. So that means k is equal to 4. And I'm going to essentially partition my data into four subsets because k is equal to 4 and reserve one subset for validation and then the rest for training. Then I'm going to do this another time. I'm going to take my data again, split it again in four, but this time I'm going to validate with the second subset and, and train with respect to the rest. On the third fold, I'm going to do it with respect to the third data set, the third subset, and then the last one uh, will be the last subset. So this is fold number one. Here we've got fold number two, fold number three, and fold number four. And then here, um, whenever I've got a, a subset that is hashed like this, it means uh, validation. And then a subset that is empty like this, it means uh, training. Okay, so for k-fold cross-validation, we're going to do k experiments. Here I've got four as an example. So it means I'm going to take my data set four times, split it into four subsets. Each time I test uh, or I validate on one subset and train on the rest. But then I, I change which subset I use for validation, and I'm going to take the average of all of this. OK, so if you recall, last class we introduced our first uh, machine learning technique, very simple, k-nearest neighbor. However, this technique, like many other techniques that we're going to see, has a hyperparameter. So in this case, the hyperparameter is the number of neighbors k. And then we'd like to optimize this, and um, here, the common mistake is that often, whenever we've got some hyperparameters, it is tempting to just say, well, I'm going to try different combinations of hyperparameters uh, and, and then see which one performs best on the test set and then just use that. But this is a bit cheating, right? It would be the same as if, uh, you know, I gave you ahead of time the questions that um, uh, you would have on, on the midterm or the final exam, and you guys could practice with this and then you know, make sure that you have a good grade on, on the exam. But uh, naturally, this would not verify your knowledge in general and your ability to generalize beyond the questions that would be available. So here, you see, when we select hyperparameters, we cannot allow uh, the algorithm to look at the test set. It has to be done only with training data. And then, so this is where, if you recall, we introduced the notion of a validation set. So in other words, we have data. Some of it is reserved for testing. And rule number one of machine learning is that we're not allowed to train or to optimize any hyperparameters with the test set. Now, what's left, which is the training set, that we can divide it into some part for training and some part for validation. And this is where the hyperparameters, like the number of neighbors in k, uh, in, in k nearest neighbor, can be optimized uh, with respect to the validation set. Yes? Just a quick clarification. So if we use a validation set once to, um, I guess, help us uh, fit k, we can't use it again, the same validation set? Can we use the same validation set more than once to? OK, good question. Yeah, so can we use the same validation set multiple times to optimize k or optimize other things? So yes. Uh, so in fact, uh, the, the training set in general is going to be used multiple times to update uh, parameters of the model or hyperparameters. So we're going to see later that there's going to be lots of techniques that do great in the sense so they're going to do multiple passes through the data and, and then adjust the parameters in, in this way. 
Um, so here, whenever we do this, there is naturally a chance that we're going to overfit to, to the data, but at least we have the test set that's separate that we can use to evaluate, and then we just do the evaluation once afterwards. Okay. Now still, um, your question is great because then whenever we have a validation set beyond just the fact that maybe we're going to look at it multiple times, there's also a question about what if it's too small and then it's not really representative of what's going to happen in the future. Right? So if I'm optimizing the hyperparameters, like the number of neighbors k, with respect to a small validation set that is not uh, really representative, then maybe I'm not going to choose the best k. So one solution for this is what we talked about last class, which is cross-validation. So here the idea is that instead of um, really reserving part of our training set for validation and then worrying about the size of the training set, the size of the validation set, let's just use everything for both training and validation. And we can do this by running multiple experiments. So in each experiment that we're going to call a fold, Right, then what we do is that we separate the data into most of it for training, a little bit for validation, but then each time we repeat that experiment, the part that's used for validation is going to change. And then so introduce k-fold cross-validation, where here we split the data into k subsets, and then each time there's one subset for validation, the rest for training, but then we, we change which one we use for validation at each iteration. And then so we're going to do this k times and then take the average of all these accuracies, which is going to be, generally speaking, more robust than if we just have one small validation set that might have um, uh, some noise that might not be completely representative. So that's the benefit of, of using cross-validation. So it tends to just be more robust and, and giving us um, an assessment of, of our hyperparameters. OK, so if you recall, we uh, talked briefly about um, uh, the steps of doing k nearest neighbor with cross-validation to optimize the number of neighbors. And in this uh, pseudocode here, I've got two for loops, one with respect to the number of neighbors, the other one with respect to the number of subsets in which I divide my um, data set into. OK, so here. Um, it's a little bit confusing because k is used both to indicate the number of neighbors, uh, as in k nearest neighbor, but also the number of splits or the number of subsets, as in k-fold cross-validation. So uh, in the literature, k is used in this way for both, but then in this slide, I cannot use k for both, so I'm going to use k to indicate the number of neighbors and k prime to indicate the number of splits of my training data. OK, so um, yeah, So if you look carefully at the algorithm, um, then yeah, we go through the, um, yeah, we have a loop that looks at every number of neighbors. Then for a specific k, then we're going to do cross-validation, where we essentially split our data um, k prime times. And then we reserve one subset for validation, the rest for training. So here you can see that we train on most of the data except one of the subset, and then we test, or really here it means we validate with the remaining part of our training data. So that gives us an estimate of the accuracy. We repeat this k prime times, and then we take the average of all those accuracies, which gives us now a more robust estimate. Uh, after that, we're ready to determine what's our best number of neighbors, k star. And if you recall here, when I write argmax, it means I take the argument of the maximum um, with respect to k uh, for this expression. So, so I'm looking for the k that gives me the highest accuracy. Once I have this best k, which is k star, then I retrain, this time with all of the data to get a hypothesis, and then I test just once with respect to the test data to evaluate the accuracy of this hypothesis. OK, any questions? Yes? Yeah, after we find the best k, right, then we'd like to return a hypothesis. 
So we could return the hypothesis that we found here for the best k, but this hypothesis was actually found just with respect to a, a subset of the training data. So we might as well retrain and use the entire data set. Uh, so that's why here we, we retrain once with respect to all of the training data. Yeah. Okay. All right, so this is great. Um, now, an alternative uh, to look at the number of neighbors is instead of trying to determine a number k, we could say, well, why don't we do something smoother? You know, some neighbors are really close and perhaps should be given more importance, and some other neighbors are much further, and maybe we could give them a lower importance. So one idea is then to define a weighting function, w, that measures, um, uh, well, it, it, it measures roughly the inverse of the distance between um, every point x prime in, in our training set with respect to the query point x. So I've got a query point x, and instead of finding just the k nearest neighbor, I could consider lots of neighbors, and then I could just give them a weight that decays based on their distance. Right? So, so then if I use a k that is large, and I've got some neighbors that are pretty far, right? then instead of um, uh, having to tweak k, uh, what I can do is simply give a lower weight to those neighbors that are further, and this is something that's more graceful, something that adapts better, because in some cases I might have some neighborhood where I've got lots of points, and I can use a large k, and then in some other neighborhood, the data might be more sparse, I don't have as much data, and then k should be smaller. So this is a way to do this kind of more smoothly and uh, still to achieve good results. Uh, here the notion of distance, we can use any distance measure, and then the weight function, um, I'm just giving an example here that we can simply use the inverse of the distance, but there's lots of, of weight functions that we could use. The intuition is that again, you just want something that decays as the distance increases. Now, once you've got the weight function defined, then um, you can determine what is the best class simply by taking um, a weighted sum um, well, I guess a sum of the weights um, of, of all the classes. So, so instead of taking the class that is the most frequent, right, then you add up the weights for each class, and then the class that has the largest sum of weights will be the one that wins. Any questions regarding this? Okay, very good. Okay, so... Now we also talked about doing k nearest neighbor in the context of classification, but then a natural question could be, can we use k nearest neighbor also for regression? So if you recall, the main difference between classification and regression is that in regression, the output is going to be a real number, right? So in classification, it was a class, it was something categorical. We're essentially counting how many of the nearest neighbors or whatever their weights are to determine the best class. But now if we have real numbers, we're going to have to do something different. But we can use k nearest neighbor for regression. And then it's as simple as um, changing the way we determine the output by, let's say, computing the average of the k nearest neighbor. So each uh, neighbor, x prime, is associated with a real value, y of x prime. And now, if we have k nearest neighbor, we've got k of those uh, real values, and we need to aggregate them in some fashion. So perhaps the simplest is just to take the average. So that's what this shows here. But then, with also what we just discussed, where we can weight the nearest neighbors based on their distance, we could also weight their prediction. So then that would give us uh, let's say a weighted combination of the predictions. So this is a nice, smooth way of combining the predictions just by weighting their importance based on the inverse of the distance.